Have you ever felt the pull of mystery? Introducing Seeker's Notes, a classic hidden object game. Seeker's Notes isn't just another game. It's a premium hobby with no ads, no Wi-Fi needed, and it's completely free. Over 40 million fans have already been captivated by its charm. So why not come see what it's all about? Download Seeker's Notes now for free and see for yourself. The Neverland Podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. You can, of course, get a free audiobook download at www.audibletrial.com slash neverlandpodcast. There is over 100,000 titles to choose from, from your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or other MP3 player. The Neverland Podcast number 11. Take a start of the right and stay until morning. Neverland. Good morning, Neverland. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, and welcome back to the Neverland Podcast. I am, as always, your host, Jeremy. Uh, Got lots of fun for you, holiday-related fun for you this week. Uh, We are going to take a look at the Hall of Presidents over in Disney World. I have some audio I've recorded from my trip there back in 2009 that I'm going to share in honor of President's Day this Monday. Also, we'll have a song of the week in honor of Valentine's Day, which, as the time of this recording and the time you're listening to it, has passed, and I do hope you enjoyed your Valentine's Day. But before that, of course, I will share some interesting fun news and information uh, on for upcoming comic book-related television and movies or anything else that I find is interesting that I think you would enjoy. Also, I will have a movie review of the recently released film, RoboCop. So, uh, grab your nearest pixie, shake a little bit of dust here, grab that happy thought, and we'll go off to Neverland, and let's get started. What if I told you that even the worst neighborhood in America could be made completely safe? How do I know this? Because it's happening right now in every country in the world but this one. It is great to see American machines helping to promote peace abroad. So then tell me, why can't we use these machines here at home? Why is America so robophobic? We need to give Americans a product they can love, a figure they can rally behind. We can't put a machine on the street. Forget machines. They want a product the conscience. Something that knows what it feels like to be human. Give your mom a kiss. My baby. Too slow, boy. We're gonna put a man inside a machine. Time to wake him up. Make him work. Tactical. Let's go with black. Quality control, EM-208 versus Tin Man. Wow. We are going to make a lot of money. He's coming. Don't play good cop, bad cop. Bad cop, Robocop. He's undoing what we did to him. Shut him down! Thank you for your cooperation. Okay, so some might ask, why am I covering this film for the Neverland podcast? Well, we are kind of reliving our childhood, and and if you're my age, then as a child, you probably saw the original RoboCop back in the 80s. Now, granted, it was a very violent movie and earned that R rating, 
uh, with language and stuff like that, but uh, we still probably all saw it as children. Uh, well, perhaps most of us. Uh, so, you know, when they, I heard they were going to remake the film, I was kind of skeptical, thinking, well, how could you remake the movie, you know, and seeing the kind of black colors and seeing the kind of new kind of suit, I thought, well, I mean, that does look cool, but uh, it's, it's, it's very different from the other one, so, I mean, it's iffy, you know. I'm kind of, I kind of get set in things if something I like it as a kid, you know, and they change it in a, a future version. Some part of me says, oh, I don't know if I want you to change what it was, and, uh, but uh, this version of RoboCop stars Joel Kinnaman, uh, which is pretty, he's pretty new to the American audiences. He's playing, of course, Alex Murphy, better known as RoboCop. Uh, this movie also has Gary Oldman as Dr. Den- Dennett Norton, Michael Keaton as Raymond Sellers, uh, Abby Cornish, which I, she looked familiar to me. I, I haven't really looked into what else she is, but she plays Clara Murphy. Now, the very interesting thing is, yes, Clara Murphy, Alex Murphy's wife, does continue to play a role throughout the film. She's not just a one-off, disappeared, and only comes back in a flashback. She's actually very important to the story. Uh, Jackie Earl Haley plays a character named Rick Maddox. Now, Jackie Earl Haley, if you happen to watch the series Human Target, which sadly only lasted for two seasons, it was actually a very good show. It's based off a DC comic that I haven't actually read. Uh, But Jackie Earl Haley, he's real good at playing very smart, yet unsure if you can trust that character type. Uh, He also, most recently that I'm aware of, uh, was in the remake or reimagining of The Nightmare on Elm Street. He, of course, is the new Freddy Krueger. Whether that's going to lead into making sequels of that film, I do not know. Uh, Also, Michael K. Williams plays Jack Lewis. Yes, Lewis is a man this time, which you know, would be kind of a bit of a throw-off. I'm sure a lot of people would be like, no, we liked Lewis as a woman. But you know what? He was a very interesting character and uh, really added a lot to the story, being, you know, a different kind of friendship. And it also, you know, with your original RoboCop films, you know, Officer Lewis was almost uh, like a, a romantic duo kind of thing. You know, there were, it kind of seemed to have that, but it didn't really, but yet it sort of did. Uh, well, because they want to have Clara, his uh, Alex Murphy's wife, still in there, it made sense to uh, just turn Lewis into a man and just get rid of that whole thing. Uh, also, you'll notice Jay... Uh, I never get his name. Baruchel. Uh, well, he was Hiccup in the How to Train Your Dragon films, and also he's been in some other movies, uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice with, uh, with uh, Nicolas Cage. Um, and also Samuel L. Jackson as Pat Novak, who is a media commentator. Now, you may have heard from the trailer that I just played, uh, this this film deals with a lot of issues that we kind of deal with in our modern day, like media bias. Uh, basically, the, the plot of this movie works around Omnicorp, which is apparently a branch off from OCP, uh, which they do mention in the later. There's a lot of throwbacks to the original films, which is wonderful. Uh, but their products, you know, their ED-209, also known as ED-209 to us in the 80s, and also an uh, EM, uh, I believe they called it a 208, I don't know, but it's more of a humanoid type of robot. They've been using the robots and, of course, making money, selling them as security forces around the world in, like, possible terrorist areas. And the film actually opens with Pat Novak on his... His whatever his news, you know, it's like the no, the Novak Report. I can't remember what they called it, but it's on his news media show, and he's showing how around the world uh, these robots are going there, and they are making things secure. We're not putting American lives in, in jeopardy, uh, but you kind of get this feeling that you know, these are also these very cold-hearted, very solid, uh, secure type of things. They are they're missing that human element, and an incident does happen. Uh, I won't get into because I don't want to spoil anything. But the plot kind of goes from there that in the United States, they're not allowing these machines to secure things in the United States. And the the major concern is that they don't have any human thought. They show no compassion or no thought process. And if they even assessed a, say, a kid as a threat, they would probably shoot the kid because they don't think. They just automatically run a program. Uh, and so in the, in the United States, we have a Dreyfus Act that was sponsored by a senator by the last name of Dreyfus, uh, and it of course prohibits robots being used in the uh, general public for security. So in comes Raymond Sellers, played by Michael Keaton. He is the head of Omnicorp. He wants to be able to 
well, he will he will say he's trying to secure the streets here in, in Detroit, as an example. Uh, but really, you know, they're in it for the money. They can make a lot of money by, of course, producing these robots and selling them onto the market and or into the public square for security. So now, how do you do that? If the main concern is that you're missing that human element, well, of course, as you hear in the trailer, he says, why don't we put a human into the machine? Now, this really does deal with some interesting issues. Uh, now, in the original RoboCop film... Uh, the transition from Alex Murphy to RoboCop, you know, happens in, what, about five minutes of screen time? Now this, it takes time. I mean, basically, you, you, you get to look in the perspective of Alex Murphy where he's, uh, instead of being the very ultra-violent shooting death uh, in the original, he is, he is hit with a car bomb. Um, and suddenly he wakes up, and he's his body, he still feels, you know, he's got the phantom pain thing going on in his body, but he notices his body is this old metallic thing and he kind of thinks he's wearing a suit, but it kind of begs the question, what if you kind of had like a massive accident and the next time you wake up, you're mostly machine and dealing with that and his wife actually has to give permission for them to do this and the whole gui uh, guideline was of this was to try to save his life. Uh, very great character. Gary Oldman has a great role in this as Dr. Dennett Norton, who is he has developed prosthetic limbs uh, that are robotic for people, and he really wants to help people. And there's a really touching scene of he's trying to help a guy who was used to be able to play guitar and has lost his arms. I won't get too much into that scene because I don't want to spoil anything. But uh, So he's really in it to help. So he, he looks at this as an opportunity to save a man's life and give him a life, even if his, most of his body is gone. Uh, so you really do. And so he's, he's really kind of pulling, you know, the, for the human half of Alex Murphy. Uh, and as things go along, you know, Alex Murphy has, has to take time to learn how to use his new body that he has and try to get used to it. And there's some interesting things of comparing him to just a straight drone robot. And they notice that him being human, he's a little slower. And so throughout the course of things, the, the company is telling Dr. Norton that, well, we need him to be more of a machine than a man. If, if there's something that human, human have that's flawed, that doesn't work the way we want it to, make it more machine. And so they keep altering and altering. Uh, and so the, the entire film is basically you're watching a man get deteriorated back to a human, and then, of course, his journey back to becoming a human who just happens to... Uh, his entire body is mechanical. And so it so becomes a very fun movie, a very human story, and not as much action as, like, the, the original that you would expect. Um, but... Just really good, compelling story. A lot of great characters in this. A lot of good throwbacks to the original film. Uh, I give it a big thumbs up. I really enjoyed it from start to finish. A uh, little bit of humor. Not a whole lot of humor, but just a lot of fun to watch. And just really kind of compelling. And, uh, yeah, very, very, very good. Uh, there was something else I was going to throw in here that I absolutely forgot what I was saying. Oh, yes, a very good line that I think really sums up the movie, something that Gary Oldman's character says. Uh, he says that we are giving Alex Murphy the illusion of control. And that really sums up everything. So, yes, definitely go out, see this new RoboCop. I will warn you, it is a pretty good solid for PG-13. There is, is some stuff that might be a little rough on your kids. Uh, at one point, Alex Murphy does wish to see what is left of his body. And very much like Iron Man, they're able to remove all the mechanical parts to him. And you see what is left of him. He has one hand that they were able to save, plus his head, which is open with his brain showing. And then his lungs, uh, they managed to save lungs and heart as inside of this kind of plastic-looking uh, container. And his lungs, you can see, breathing, which is very kind of a cool effect. But for small children, it might be a little horrifying. Uh, so be warned. So it's not really something you take your kids to. But uh, I do highly recommend this film. Okay, moving on to what I, news that I'm finding interesting now. There's a lot of things coming out from... Uh, there's currently a toy fair going on in New York, and I wish I was there to be able to look at some of the stuff and be able to tell you about it. Uh, a few highlights is pretty much, uh, pretty much any Marvel movie that is coming out this year, there are toys for it. Uh, and actually, a lot of movies even have Lego toys coming out. In fact, they uh, finally have shown a bit more about the Ghostbusters Lego toys that are coming out. Uh, also, Activision has announced uh, through IGN that uh, there is a Transformers Rise of the Dark Spark game coming out for multiple platforms. Uh, don't really know much about this and everything, but uh, hoping, of course, it's going to be fantastic. Uh, also, some very interesting 
interesting news. Uh, there is a viral site, you know, the Daily Bugle site for uh, Amazing Spider-Man 2, has been uh, teasing some stuff with a uh, DJ Novak playing Alistair Smythe. Now, I did not know that B.J. Novak was in this movie as Aleister Smythe. That is very exciting to me, although I worry sometimes they might be bringing in too many characters at one time, but uh, we'll just have to see how it plays out, because he doesn't have to emerge as a major Spider-Man villain yet. But uh, I'd like to see where they go with the character by the time they get around to a third movie. Uh, B.J. Novak, you know, after spending years watching him on The Office and having kind of a funny character that you kind of love to hate there by the end of it, um, I uh, actually had a really good turn as Robert Sherman in Saving Mr. Banks. Uh, so he's really kind of expanding and showing a lot of different uh, roles he can do. So I'm pretty excited about this. I, I, Like I said, I had no idea that this character was involved in this movie. Uh, and also, something else interesting has been brought to my attention. Warner Brothers is making a Tarzan film. Uh, it's slated to be uh, released into theaters July 1st, 2016. Uh, this is a new live-action 3D movie. Now, whether that means they are going to motion capture and bringing it as a 3D computer animated, or if they just plan on releasing it in 3D... Uh, I am unsure. I'm not exactly sure what they mean by that. But, you know, the potential is there for something very exciting. I have actually read the original Edgar Rice Burroughs Tarzan. Uh, it is completely different than what you might have expected if you're used to, like, the animated one that Disney did and things like that. Uh, it's a very violent book, but very, very good. Uh, also, we are getting some interesting information. Uh, Marvel Studios president uh, Kevin Feige, uh, he's kind of in charge of the cinematic or MCU Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, was speaking to a website called Comic Book Movie and has mentioned that the Black Widow has a very big role. Uh, she's actually appearing in Captain America the Winter Soldier as well as the uh, Avengers Age of Ultron as she's one of the Avengers. But he says, uh, we learn more about her past and learn more about where she came from and how she became in that film. The notion of exploring that even further in her own film would be great, and we have some development work with that. Now, did you catch that? They are exploring some stuff and about her own film, and have said how that would be great, and we have some development. Now, so apparently there's some sort of development going for a potential Black Widow film solo movie. Uh, which could be good. Uh, I, I don't know how far along this might be. That might turn out that they decide not to do it. I don't know, but they're ignoring it. Uh, as uh, I brought this up on my Facebook when I had found this, some people were saying, well, what about a Hawkeye movie? Which I would be glad to see a Hawkeye solo movie, too. They could solo movie a lot of uh, the Avengers characters. I'm still hoping for another Incredible Hulk movie myself. Uh, but also, uh, uh, there's some men some more quotes from Kevin Feige about uh, Black Widow appearing in The Winter Soldier, and he promises a game changer for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, and his his quote is, uh, "We wanted to change the dynamic of the cinematic universe with this film. We wanted Cap and really the entire cinematic universe to be very different at the end of Winter Soldier than it is at the beginning. Therefore, when we meet the Avengers at the top of Age of Ultron, it's a very different landscape than we left them at the end of the first." First film. Partially, that's because we love the rhythm that the comic books had developed. Each of the characters appear in their runs. Occasionally, they get together for a big event or crossover series. They part again, and then they come back together again. Uh, now, Avengers Age of Ultron hits the theaters May 1st of 2016, but uh, right here in April, we can expect to see Captain America in action again versus the Winter Soldier. Now, uh, this is exciting. I, I, know I haven't really paid a lot of attention to X-Men in the last few years. I, my heyday was really kind of in the 90s for X-Men. Uh, the only Marvel real life paid attention to is Spider-Man because that's my overall favorite character. And they did some odd things with X-Men that I was kind of, eh, you know. And There's been some good stories. I still have, you know, checked some things out of the library. But uh, there are plans for an all-new X-Men series focusing around Cyclops. Uh, this is supposed to be coming out in May from writer Greg Rucka and artist Russell Dotterman, or Dotterman, I'm not sure how you say his name. Uh, it is part of the, the all-new Marvel now, and there's, uh, I guess there's some potential spoilers for all-new X-Men number 23, so I really don't want to read a whole lot of here. There is a quote 
from Rucka uh, right here on SuperheroHype.com. If you would like to read it yourself, go right ahead. But uh, this is supposed to be showing a young Scott Summers actually teaming up with his presumed dead father, Christopher Summers, a.k.a. Corsair, uh, leader of the Star Jammers from some Outer Space Adventures. Well, that's what they're reporting on SuperheroHype.com. Uh, so this might be, I guess, before he was one of the X-Men. Uh, there's something new about the, the all-new X-Men. I mean, like I said, I haven't really been paying attention, and really I haven't paid attention to Spider-Man since the Doc Ock incident, which is finally altering here in May. And so I'll be jumping back into that bandwagon really quick. All right, final bit of news. I have to get some Star Wars news whenever there's some Star Wars news available. I'm very excited about this. Uh, Star Wars The Clone Wars will be debuting on Netflix with a final season. That's right. An all-new 13-episode season dubbed The Lost Missions will be the entire Star Wars, you know, with, the, of course, the entire Star Wars Clone Wars saga is being reported by SuperheroHype.com also. Uh, there's, this is a deal that's uh, at least for a year. Uh, so go ahead, you know, if you got your Netflix subscription, uh, which, you know, I really need to partner with them and have them become a sponsor because there's some really good stuff on Netflix that I would like to be able to talk about. But uh, I have a, a Netflix account. Very excited about this. I, I did watch, uh, I think, the majority of the Clone Wars series. Uh, I wouldn't mind sitting and watching it again. I did miss the last couple seasons. Um, but, uh, of course, a final season would be very interesting because I'd like to see how they transition it into the events of Episode 3 before, of course, we get a launch for the new Star Wars Rebels series, which as we've gone over before, is going to have a debut movie on the Disney Channel. Uh, and uh, there has been announced that Freddie Prinze Jr. is actually voicing one of the characters. But that about wraps it up for the news I'm going to cover this week. And so now, let's move on to our regular content. But before I do that, I would like to go through and remind you that for you, the listeners of the Neverland Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. Okay, now I have been recommending for the last few weeks that they do have The Hobbit Unabridged by J.R.R. Tolkien. And if you're anything like me, you would enjoy that. Uh, You know, it's great to have an audiobook to listen to in the car. I happen to drive all day for a living so i like you know audiobooks in the car is a great thing even if i was working in an office when i was you know i've, I've spent years in an office too i listen to audiobooks all the time in that it's a great way to be able to uh, get you through your day and, and feed your mind while you're working and everything so i very much recommend going to something like audible.com so you can get all the audiobook audiobooks that you care to want uh, now, to or to download your free audiobook today, you need to go to audibletrial.com slash neverlandpodcast. Again, that is audibletrial.com slash neverlandpodcast. You can get your free audiobook and your free 30-day subscription trial. Okay. Now, I have some great content that I would like to share with you today. And uh, before I get to it, and before I talk about President's Day, I do have a song of the week for you. Uh, of course, because Valentine's Day was just this past Friday, I wanted to have some song that have, that dealt something with love. A little bit of a clip here, of course. I'm not going to share the entire song, but just a clip. Uh, but I wanted to give it a slightly different bent of things. If you hear the entire song, you'll understand it. But this is by actually one of my favorite bands called Disciple, and it's a song called After the World. You break the glass, try to hide your face, record just will not erase and buried in your loss of innocence you wonder if you'll find it again was I there for the worst of all your pain and was I there when your blue sky ran Flooding you, I hold your feet. Those are my tears. 
right, once again, sorry for the abrupt cutoff that my clips have if I don't play the entire song, but I don't really know how to make it fade with the program I'm using. Uh, but I will make that song available also with the album that it is a part of available on iTunes. I will put a link up, provided, of course, I can find it on iTunes, uh, but I'll put a link up for you, which you can find at NeverlandPodcast.com. And once again, if you purchase anything from iTunes off of uh, the Neverland Podcast website, or if you go through audible.com uh, or go to the audibletrial.com slash Neverland Podcast, there are even links for Audible on my website. It does help support the podcast, and I really do appreciate anybody who clicks through those links. Uh, but without further ado, uh, tomorrow is actually President's Day, and uh, many of you will actually have the day off. And in honor of President's Day, I have a recording uh, from that's actually taken from my video of when I was in Disney World, my only trip that I've ever been there, which is why I'm not a Disney podcast. I've only got one trip there. So Plus, there's like 80 million Disney podcasts out there, and I have a lot of other things I'm into other than Disney, although Disney owns most of what I'm into when you consider Star Wars and Marvel and things like that. But anyways, I digress. But I had my trip back in 2009, uh, and it was a, a brand new. They had just refurbished the Hall of Presidents to include uh, the current President Barack Obama in there. So it had been open just recently. I had a great, uh, it's kind of got like a film strip slideshow kind of thing. And also, of course, animatronics of all the presidents, including this phenomenal one of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, very lifelike. It was, it's amazing to see, especially when they go and they uh, list all the presidents together. They all are kind of they'll kind of nod your head as the light comes on, kind of nod to you. And even when they're they're not getting the attention, they're kind of looking around. They'll look over at whoever's being focused on and everything. Just very lifelike, even when they're just all standing around. It's a great presentation. Uh, and least, unless you absolutely hate this country, I highly recommend going into the Hall of Presidents. It is a great way of looking at the history of our great country. Uh, so without further ado, here is from 2009 Walt Disney World, the Hall of Presidents. Happy President's and Day! At this time, I'm proud to say that Walt Disney World Resorts presents Hall of Presidents, a celebration of Liberty's leaders, featuring the voice of Academy Award winning Morgan Freeman. We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Almost 250 years ago in Philadelphia, a dream was born. astounding revolutionary dream that we the people should choose our own leaders that they should be one of us this was a dream born of fire safeguarded by sacrifice during a brutal winter at valley forge yet it was a dream that was almost over before it had truly begun. The war for independence had left the American colonies bankrupt. Leaders argued, unpaid troops rebelled, and some even cried out for a return to monarchy and for General George Washington to be crowned King of America. But the man who had led an army of farmers to victory over the mighty British Empire made it clear that the only title he desired was citizen of the United States of America. I am at a loss to conceive what part of my conduct could have given encouragement to an idea which to me seems the greatest mischief that can befall our country. If you have any regard for yourself, banish these thoughts from your mind. But when the new nation finally adopted its constitution, and it came time to elect its first president, there were no doubts about who that president should be. Only he had such doubts. I fear my countrymen will expect too much of me. I walk on untrodden ground. 
there is scarcely any part of my conduct which may not hereafter be drawn into precedent. In the end, Washington set the most important precedent of all. The man who could have been king stepped down after two terms in office and took his place again amongst the people. By insisting that he was, above all other things, one of us, he made it possible for any of us to dream of serving the nation in its highest office. And one day, sure enough, it came to pass that a man who wasn't an aristocrat aspired to the office of president. Andrew Jackson was a battle-forged frontiersman, and according to his predecessor, President John Quincy Adams, a barbarian who cannot write a sentence of grammar and can hardly spell his own name. To which Jackson merely replied, It's a damn poor mind indeed that can't think of at least two ways to spell a word. He may have lacked formal education, but he was tough and brilliant. Just the ticket for a new nation of Americans struggling to turn a dream into an enduring reality. They swept Jackson into office by a landslide and then descended on his inauguration, determined to shake his hand in person. What, 20,000 country people shove to get in the door and no. track their muddy boots across the carpet. And my dear, they would be here still if we hadn't placed tubs of punch out on the lawn. Washington's elite fumed, but Jackson loved it, for these were his people. He was proud to be one of us. I do not forget that the planter, the farmer, the mechanic, and the laborer form the great body of the people of the United States. They are the bone and sinew of this country. But Andrew Jackson would wage a mighty struggle to hold that great body of people together. State by state, a monstrous injustice that had haunted the country since its beginning was now tearing it apart. As civil war threatened, we searched deep in our heartland for a leader equal to the ordeal ahead. It was perhaps a vindication of the American dream that we found a plain-spoken, self-taught lawyer from Illinois whose campaign platform could be summed up in five simple words. All men are created equal. I say this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Abraham Lincoln's words touched the hearts of reasonable men. And in 1860, we sent him to Washington where he would face the hardest task that any American president would ever face. I know there is a God, and that he hates injustice and slavery. I see the storm coming. I know his hand is in it. If he has a place, work for me. And I think he has. I believe I'm ready. I am nothing. But truth is everything. And with God's help, I shall not fail. April 12, 1861, Fort Sumner. The cannon spoke for war. Bitter, violent. Americans were shared in the dark days of our civil war. But as the sun rose on a cold November day in 1863, thousands of Americans gathered on the battlefield in Gettysburg to hear President Abraham Lincoln give meaning to our sacrifice. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent 
a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. This nation did have a new birth of freedom. And as our frontiers pushed west, we looked for new leaders that embodied our hope the new spirit. Leaders like Theodore Roosevelt, born to wealth and privilege, but imbued with the spirit of the American frontier. He rode with cowboys and led his rough riders up San Juan Hill during the Spanish-American War. This kind-hearted, tough guy fought against monopolies and for the working class. We called him Teddy. Anything else would have been far too formal. He even refused to call his official residence the executive mansion. To him, it was just a house. It was just a white house. And so, it would always be called. Three decades later, his distant cousin Franklin Delano Roosevelt would occupy that same White House and lead the country through its hardest trials since the Civil War. A world war was looming, and the Great Depression had paralyzed a great nation. The president we called upon to lead us through those hard times was himself paralyzed by polio. But with determined optimism, he had triumphed and now he was ready to share his cheerful strength with a badly frightened people. During FDR's fireside chats on the radio, entire cities came to a standstill and listened to the people themselves. Let us unite in banishing fear. Together, we cannot fail. In a calm and reassuring voice, he called out to America, and America answered back. We're just modest, middle-class people having lost what little we, we have. My savings are tied up in a closed bank. I believe that you will guide us through this. Step up here in my conference in Europe, dear President. And I expect to be in service shortly. Now we know we are not fighting alone. I feel that at last we can hope. With that hope, we began to believe in the future again. FDR had reminded us of the power of the American dream. Sixteen years later, America's youngest elected president once again called upon the power of the people to change the world. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friends and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans 
John F. Kennedy's stirring words ushered in a historic decade of civic activism in which ordinary Americans struggled to right old wrongs and chart new frontiers of possibility. It has always been the role of presidents to remind us of our roots, to call us to the future. In their best moments, they speak words that are already there in our hearts, especially in times of tragedy. not to be standing here today. We mourn seven heroes. We mourn their loss as a nation together. You have lost too much, but you have certainly not lost America. For we will stand with you. present that is rooted in our past, 
For all of Liberty's leaders have one thing in common, one trust they all accept. My fellow citizens, no event could have filled me with greater anxieties than that notification on the 14th day of April, 1789, that you had selected me to lead our nation. But it was with the confidence of my fellow citizens that I took an oath. 35 simple words that have been repeated by every American president throughout history. As long as that oath is taken and solemnly fulfilled, the American dream will endure. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. Ladies and gentlemen, President Barack Obama. The American dream is as old as our family, but as timeless as our hopes. It is reborn every day in the heart of every child who wakes up in a land of limitless possibilities, in a country where we the people meets all the people. We may come from different places, believe different things. But what makes us American is a shared spirit. A spirit of courage and determination, of kindness and generosity. It is a spirit grounded in the wisdom of the generations that have gone before us, but open to the unimagined discoveries and possibilities on the horizon that lies ahead. Let us enjoy it, cherish it, defend it, Pass it on to our children as the bright and beautiful blessing it is. This enduring American dream. So there you have it, the 2009 Walt Disney World Hall of Presidents located in the Magic Kingdom. I hope you really enjoyed that. I, you know, watching the video is one thing. Listening to the audio always kind of gets to me. It's uh, it's just good because I, you know, I'm, I'm very glad of where I was born. I'm hope where if you were born in some other country and you listen to this, I hope you're happy for where you're born as well. And that uh, maybe there's some, just as much respect for your leaders as we have for our leaders here, even when we don't agree with them. Uh, uh, but I would like to thank you for clicking that download button uh, to listen to this week for the Neverland Podcast. And just to remind everybody, we're available on iTunes. We're available also on Stitcher Radio. And I would love for you to take the time on iTunes and Stitcher Radio to go into uh, whatever the store uh, on iTunes and go in and write us up a review. Give us a rating. It does help other people to find the Neverland Podcast. And I love having new people come and discover us and all the fun that we're having here in Neverland, reliving our childhood or things in the modern world that make us feel like a kid just trying to spread a little bit of pixie dust around and just enjoy ourselves and just smile every once in a while and have something positive at the beginning of our week so remember to tell your friends tell your enemies tell your family tell your neighbors about the neverland podcast and tell them how much you're enjoying the show send them to the website neverlandpodcast.com You'll also find links there to our Facebook and our Twitter. But if you would like to just go straight to our Twitter, remember you can tweet me at NeverlandPCast. Uh, that is, of course, the letter P, NeverlandPCast. And on Facebook, go to Facebook.com slash NeverlandPodcast or just do a search for the Neverland Podcast within Facebook and you should find us. If you'd like to send an email, feel free to do so. Just send it simply to podcast at neverlandpodcast.com. You can also find an email link down at the bottom of the page at neverlandpodcast.com. Well, that's going to do it for me. we got a pretty good lengthy show. I hope you've enjoyed the audio, and I hope you'll be excited for what happens next 
week. I haven't decided what I want to do. There are so many wonderful, fun things that we can cover that I have a hard time picking what I want to do next. So come back next week. Feel free to keep hitting that download button, and we'll fly off once again to Neverland.